Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word, for the opportunity that we have, that you, that you have given us to, to study it, to feast upon it, to hide it in our heart. It is so precious to us. I ask that you would filter out all of that, which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been uh, studying together in the first epistle to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, uh, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were... Uh, we had just finished uh, verse 15 of chapter 3. So if you want to turn with us uh, and follow us along here, it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 16. We have seen that as we studied through this, that we are God's field and we are God's building and that it, it is uh, God who is supplying the increase to that building that uh, one plants, that another waters, but God gives the increase. He causes the growth. And just as was the uh, as it was with the, in the case of Paul and Apollos, so uh, it is with us. And uh, I asked the question, you know, how do we build uh, if it's God giving the increase? And uh, I suggested that our responsibility before God is is how he uses us in that increase. It's a privilege to be used by God in the building of that temple, which is Christ. Uh, so how does he use us? Is it willingly or is it unwillingly? Uh, was it like gold, silver, precious stone or hay, wood, stubble? And so for those who missed that last video, I, I recommend you watch the last video if you're just now coming into this. I believe the text indicates that all of us will have some gold, silver, precious stone left after it's tested by fire, even if it's, it's nothing but the fact that we're his child. Uh, and I pointed out how that it is our singular life's work that will be judged. It's, it's if, if any man's work, singular. It's not individual works where God's not going to show some filthy movie of every rotten thing we ever did. I also pointed out how that the text is saying that we are all members of the singular temple. Again, we have a singular. It is one temple, and that temple is Christ. That temple or that building being our Lord Jesus Christ. And that we're not a uh, just a bunch of little temples running around here. And that the, the any man in the text defiling that one temple uh, is, is stressing individuals, but we collectively, together, we are the singular temple of God. Temple is singular. You are uh, God's temple. We are God's temple. Uh, you ought to absolutely know, uh, verse uh, 16, that uh, you are God's building. Verse 9, you're God's field and you're God's building. Uh, perfect tense. You absolutely know that. Why? Because God said it. Uh, verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. God dwelleth in you. God's Spirit lives in you. It's a, it's a present tense. He's continually living in you. Uh, I've talked to Christians who seem to have this uh, idea that sometimes, well, you know, the Holy Spirit lives in you and sometimes he leaves you. Sometimes he departs. Uh, sometimes he kind of takes a break from you. And that is not true. You know, he, he, he leaves, you know, depending on how naughty you are. 
or what you've been doing, but the text clearly says that he always dwells in you. The grammar says he always dwells in you. God not only became our kinsman redeemer and was made sin for us, but we were made the righteousness of God in him. You stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Uh, we saw in Romans chapter 8, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. Uh, so in uh, verse 16 of chapter 2, you know, we, we have the mind of Christ. Uh, clearly, the mind of Christ infers the Holy Spirit, God Almighty. He dwells within you. Uh, I'm not able to come up with words enough to describe how amazing that is. You know, just how profound that that is and, and how important that that is. Every moment of your life, God's Spirit dwells within you. He knows what you think. He knows what you, what you plan. You know, He, uh, he, uh, he knows uh, how you act. Uh, and he's your loving heavenly father. It's astounding that we can say that he loves us with an, uh, an everlasting love. Uh, it's, uh, it bothers me when people say, you know, well, how could God possibly love me when I know how I live? You know, there is that, that idea, that insidious idea in human nature that if God loves us, well, then there ought to be a reason for it. And, and, and if he doesn't love somebody else, well, it's probably because they're worse than we are. But what that says is that in your eyes, you can't come up with what's in you of such merit that God should love you. And dearly beloved, my answer has always been, he loves you because you're his. That's why he loves you. We're his children. Don't you know? No, you not. Don't you know that you're the temple of God that you're God's temple, and that temple is holy, that is, it is set apart by God for his use. It is holy. This is what the text says. It, and now we got a problem. I mean, if, uh, I suppose, uh, I suppose that We need to sort of iron out a few wrinkles here. It's the temple of God is holy. And I understand we've been made the righteousness of God, God in Christ. The word holy, though, is, is the word sanctified, set apart. We're set apart by God, just as, you know, in the Old Testament, pots and pans were set aside. Sue has a, a, a skillet that she uses just for certain things that's set aside. That, that skillet is holy. Okay, that's what the word means. And the temple of God is holy. We saw at the beginning that we were sanctified in Christ Jesus. Uh, and now we're going to read in verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So, uh, if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Sounds kind of scary until we understand that uh, uh, 
you know, we've already been told in the 16th verse that God's spirit dwells in us, present tense. He's always there. He doesn't come and go. Uh, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, but the temple is holy. It's set apart for God. Uh, so the Holy Spirit's always there. He doesn't come and go. You can quench the spirit. You can grieve the spirit, but you can't kick him out. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, God's spirit dwells in you because you are his temple. We are his temple. And now we have a, another first class condition. Now, bear in mind, as I, I need to keep reminding you here, uh, any man, if any man, defy, that, is, that is any single man, any, any man, any woman, anyone. And then we have the word defile. And we've got to look at that. And we have the word destroy. And in both cases, this word means corrupt. In fact, it's the same Strong's number, Strong's concordance number, same number, uh, same word in the Greek. Uh, in fact, every place else, if, if you have the King James Every place else that that word occurs in the New Testament, it is translated corrupt or corruption. And, and neither one of those are, are in this version. Now, I don't know why. I can't answer. I can't speak for the translators. I don't know why that they, they, they translated the way that they did. Now, if you have other translations, I don't know how they translated if any man shall corrupt God's temple, him shall God corrupt. That's what the text is saying. And the reason why that, why that is, is because God's temple is holy. It's set apart for God. God set that one temple apart for him. We saw that in the beginning of our study. The word holy doesn't essentially mean righteous and pure and, and uh, uh, sinless. It means it's set apart for God's use, just like the pots and the pans in the Old Testament, and just like Sue's skillet. Uh, I have screwdrivers. Uh, I have certain tools in my tool shed that are set apart for a certain use. So they're holy. The, the altar was holy. That means uh, uh, it was set apart for God. That means you have been set apart by the sovereign God for his use, okay? And that is a sobering thought. It's a sobering thought to know that what's happening to you in your life is because you have been set apart by God for his use. Please keep that in mind when we get to the very end of this chapter, okay? Uh, I hope to bring that back into it. Now, he may not use you as he uses others. He won't use you, uh, I don't think, as exactly the same way that he uses others. Uh, I'm a, of the persuasion, you know, I could be wrong, but the particular activity that God has in you, that he works in you, the way he works in you, or the things that he does in, you, in your life, is unique. He doesn't do exactly, exactly the same thing in anybody else's life. You know, I mean, I don't know that for sure. That's just an opinion that I put in the white spaces. Uh, the 17th verse, uh, that's a first class condition, which, which indicates that some man will corrupt God's temple and, and that man will be corrupted by God because God's temple is set apart for God. Uh, and it's, it wasn't set apart by God for someone to corrupt it. <coughs> and we <coughs> collectively, Together, uh, corporately, the body of Christ, uh, we are that temple. Uh, now, now, there are some who argue that in verse 17, you know, each and every individual is a separate temple of God. The verse is saying that God dwells, his spirit dwells in you, and that, and that we collectively are his temple. That's all of his chosen people, all of the elect, those for whom he died in their place. 
That's all of his people, all of those who have been redeemed by the finished work of Jesus Christ. That temple is God's temple. Uh, you know, but there are many who think that he's talking about many individual temples. Uh, I don't believe he is. The grammar won't allow me to say that, not here or, or in other places. Uh, you know, they say that, uh, you know, each one of us are in some sense a temple of God, and therefore somebody could defile, you know, that temple, you know, just one of you. You could defile your own temple, you, you know, your own little temple or a temple, the temple of someone else. That's not what the text is saying. That's not what the text says. I will admit that uh, if one of you is defiled, in that sense, it, it does or it will affect the entire temple of God, which is the uh, plurality of those who are his. However, I will admit that it isn't possible that one individual who would be uh, corrupted by somebody, that it wouldn't have any effect on, on any other members of the body, the members of Christ, the, the members of the temple. You know, we know that if one suffers, all suffer with it. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Holy Spirit dwells in the temple, which is the collective body of those who are his. Uh, uh, the primary reason why people believe that uh, we are each in an individual temple is because they're trying to clean up that temple. It's So it's trying to clean up the flesh. Uh one thing we could say is that this individual, this any man, whoever he is, maybe he's not a member of the body of Christ. That's one possibility. Uh, and I can't argue against that possibility. That he comes in and uh, corrupts the body in some way. And God corrupts that individual. I mean, there are many who believe that. You know, we're told that in the last time, perilous times uh, will come. I turn on your news. <laughs> uh, men will be of corrupt minds and many will depart from the, the truth. And, uh, and Peter, he tells us that there will be false prophets among us. So maybe these are the false prophets that, that, uh, that Peter and, uh, and Timothy... Uh, and others uh, in the word mentioned. Maybe they are. I can't solve that problem for you. But that is something for you to think about. So this 17th verse uh, here, uh, if any man, is this, this 17th verse, it could be speaking of one who is not one of God's children, and is maybe more than that, uh, you know, one of the false prophets or one of those who depart from the truth, you know, in perilous times. It says any man. But we also uh, have verses that say that in the last days, many shall depart from the faith, uh, fall away from the faith. Uh, the faith, and that's articulated, okay? So the next possibility is that maybe this is one of God's children who departs from the faith. That is the faithfulness of Christ. You know, for his own trusting in himself. Uh, in, in departing from the faith, does he then become a person headed for hell? Well, uh, you know, there's some who would, would say, yes, I don't believe that. Not for one moment. Uh, you know, if, if that were true, then we'd have to abandon, you know, all concepts of eternal security and the perseverance of the saints or preservation of the saints. And we'd have to relegate all of those verses, all of that scripture. We just have to, you know, toss it aside, relegate it to the uh, uh, recycle bin. But God says, I give unto them eternal life and no man is able to snatch them out of my hand. And that no one must include you. So, you know, it could be 
Uh, these are God's children who actually depart from the faith in the sense that they're trusting in themselves rather than the faithfulness of God, or, or uh, they're, they are people who profess to be in the faith and they really never were. And folks, I don't have an answer for that. But I do see where that we believers are to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. And it's talking about believers. You know, there are uh, people, uh, many, in fact, who profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And by all external uh, appearances, they appear to be new creations in Christ who are uh, are trusting not in God, uh, but in themselves. I know a, uh, a lot of Christians like that, but we are also told that if we deny him, he abides faithful. He remains faithful. He will deny us, but he cannot deny himself. He will deny us. That is, could there possibly be a connection between that and God corrupting him? Okay. Uh, we're, clear, we are, uh, we're clearly told that my sheep hear my voice. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one's able to take them out of my father's hand. You know, and I've mentioned, I've said before, you know, how long is eternal life? You know, that's, I think that's a long time. But, you know, is eternal life until one quits believing or one quits being faithful or, you know. You know, we didn't get eternal life because we believe. So how in the world can we lose it? We are clearly told that if we fail to trust God, we still have the Holy Spirit. We still possess eternal life because Jesus Christ died in our place. And we will never perish. Uh, more than that, he, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So does it seem, well, let me, let me just say, uh, it seems it seems clear to me that I could leave him, but he'll never leave me. You know, it, it's it's difficult for me to suggest that that uh, that the end. It's all it's hard for me to say that the individual here is someone who departed from the faith and is going to go to hell. Okay, I can't do that. Uh, many can, I can't do that. But it does say that if he corrupts the temple of God which God has set apart, God will corrupt him. Same word in the Greek. So I'm forced to believe that if it is a believer who does corrupt the temple of God, then God will deal with him in this life, well, just as, as he did with David. You know, uh, David was a man after God's own heart. Uh Nathan comes, you know, and tells him about what he did. And David is devastated, you know, by what he heard. Until David hears the words, fear not, David, for God has put away thy sin. Put away that sin. You know, what does that mean? Put away his sin. You know, Folks, the sword never departed from David's house. He never had a happy marriage. David lived a terrible life uh, in many respects. I mean, yeah, I believe David paid for what he did, uh, just as you and I would uh, if we did what he did. In God's plan, in God's purpose, okay, he allowed that so that we could learn from it. These scriptures are profitable for re reproof, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. I do not believe David will stand in judgment for his sin. I don't think that we will stand in judgment for our sin. That sin was placed on Christ. But the fact that Jesus Christ died in his place did not remove the physical results or consequences 
of David's sin, just as it won't in our life. You know, Uriah is still dead. But praise God, David didn't stand in judgment. Uh, so was it, you know, someone who never knew the Lord, but was there in some way or another, they corrupted the church? Or is it somebody who knew the Lord, but corrupted the church? And that's, that's the popular interpretation of this verse. Uh, you know, before long, we're going to read, uh, it, is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and, and such fornication is, it is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Uh, that's the normal popular interpretation that what we're looking at here, that that's the guy here in uh, verse 17 the any man that defiles the temple. And that may, that may very well be. That's the popular interpretation of this verse. But you might want to also consider that there's some connection between this man who, this any man who defiles the temple and the, the hay wooden stubble. Hay wood stubble. That's, uh, this is the guy whose life's work is wood, hay, stubble. But that doesn't necessarily mean uh, the the hay wooden stubble there that we looked at doesn't mean it may not necessarily mean that he's the one that corrupts the temple that God corrupts him okay you know so this is a good example of how we need to slow down and think about and meditate on these verses pray on these verses uh, uh, does that does this speak of the quality of how this man's attitude was as as God did the building you know, God is doing the building. Now, I don't think that God corrupts the building. I'm not persuaded that this individual is a, uh, personally, I'm not persuaded that this individual is a non-believer primarily, or, or he's a, even a false teacher, false prophet. It doesn't fit the context. I'm not persuaded that he's an unbeliever, and I'm, and I'm not persuaded that he's a believer who departs from the faith in the sense that that he uh, no longer wants anything to do with Christ. He no longer wants anything to do with God. And I'm, I've actually met people like that. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm going to suggest that this any man here, this any man who corrupts the temple, whom God corrupts, is primarily, First and foremost, it's speaking uh, or it's referring to a child of God who is living according to the flesh. Okay? Human performance. Hay, wood, stubble. Uh, law. We died to the law in order that we might live unto God. You know, so we're, we're that the, the wrong attitude or, or the, a wrong motive is actually becomes manifest. Uh, uh, is the temple of God defiled by somebody involved in sexual misbehavior? Well, that may very well be true. But dearly beloved, we need to realize that one's behavior or conduct is the result of the absence of biblical truth. There's always an underlying cause for why we do what we do. It, it, it seems to me that uh, that a lot of, of, of scripture, uh, a lot of the scripture that deals with fornication and adultery, there's more a spiritual application there than there is a physical one. Okay. In fact, many Christians aren't even aware that there is such a thing as spiritual adultery, you know, having an affair with the law. Uh, in studying the Old Testament, I'm surprised at, at how casually God seems to treat what we would call sexual immorality and how seriously, how truly seriously he treats things like Nadab and Abihu offering strange worship before the altar of God. I think this is, you know, I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. 
I think the supreme corruption, the supreme defilement is spiritual, folks. Uh, I mean, I'm always praying that God would not allow me to lead anyone astray. I understand that we all teach error, but my major concern is that I do not. Uh, I am much more concerned about a corruption that is doctrinal, a corruption that is spiritual, than I am about a corruption that is physical. And when I say that, okay, please, folks, please, don't misunderstand. I am not trying to make light of physical immorality. I'm not trying to make light of adultery, fornication on the physical plane, okay? Uh, I wouldn't do that for anything in the world because I don't believe that. But I believe what is of supreme importance is doctrinal, okay? Uh, I mean, what's what, which is worse, physical adultery or spiritual adultery? You know, being a spouse to Christ while having an endless affair with the law when we died to the law that we might bear fruit unto God. When Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You know, when Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And we have, according to the text that we're looking at, we have the Spirit of God permanently living in us all, every one of us, uh, who make up the body collectively. We are the one temple of God, which he set apart for his use. You know, when all that's of the flesh will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ, all that that we did in our own strength, you know, he's the vine, we're the branches. Uh, you know, we're trying to maintain some sort of relationship with God by self-effort, by law. We're, we're told to walk to, according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh, since we're told that the flesh profits nothing, okay? So what is worse, having an affair with your secretary or pleading with a congregation to believe something that isn't true Biblically. Now, well, okay, let's be fair. They're both rotten. But what's more rottener? Okay, I don't know if that's a word, rottener. It's maybe if you live in Oklahoma. I don't think there's any comparison as far as corrupting the temple is concerned. I mean, you can commit murder and adultery like David, like he did. And, you know, and it's, boy, it's nice that you confess that. But, you know, I'll tell you, that's not going to do a whole lot of good as far as the police is concerned, as, not, as far as the crime is concerned, or the, the judge is concerned. You did wrong. You know, and surely, in the sense of, of this verse, in that manner, David may have corrupted the temple of God. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that he didn't. Uh but would it be the same as going into the Holy of Holies, okay, and offering strange fire, strange sacrifice? And how about, what if that sacrifice is yourself in Christ's place, in, in Christ's stead? Not, your focus is not on him, his sacrifice, but on your own and your own abilities, your own talents, and so on and so forth. Blaspheming the work of Christ, okay? by counting the blood of the covenant wherein you are sanctified an unholy thing, having insulted the spirit of grace. I believe corruption comes through sexual immorality, uh, but I believe vastly more serious corruption comes from treating this book, treating the word of God lightly. You know, for God to say that we are his building, God's temple, when you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, uh, when he says, don't you know, don't you know that you have his spirit, that you cannot lose your eternal life, that no man shall pluck you out of your father's hand, that, that no power, no power, 
will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There may very well be some who will not get any reward uh, in that we see in this context. That each man's praise will come to him from God. But I have difficulty with that as well. Uh, but that does not mean that God did not use them in the building of his temple, okay? Even if it's hay, wood, and stubble. Uh, I think he does that. In which case there must remain, I believe, some gold, silver, precious stone. Uh, just because of what Christ did. Uh, when we get over to the fifth verse of the next chapter, I think, I think it's apparent that everyone will be uh, praised by God because he used them in the building of his temple. Now, the way that they did it may not have brought them any reward, but what was done through them was right. And for that, they get praised. So, uh, this any man, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God defile or destroy. If any man corrupt the temple of God, him shall God corrupt. Uh, I don't think this is a man who's going to lose his redemption. In the case of, of the man who commits fornication, uh, such as not once named among the Gentiles, uh, you know, we are so quick to assign that person, you know, that we're going to see later on to the lake of fire. I don't think we can do that, okay, fairly, all right? Uh, the Corinthians are urged to restore him, okay? So clearly the indication is in this, in this letter, and in the next one, well, too, is that this individual isn't going to hell, but that individual does face some problems, as just as David did when he sinned. Just as you would if you sinned. Just as I would if I sinned. I, I think that uh, the uh, most popular way to corrupt the temple is to teach false doctrine. Now, if, if you don't know what false doctrine is, well, just turn on your TV tonight. Let no man... And again, a, a singular, deceive himself. Verse 18, let no man deceive himself. And that's an easy thing to do. It's a present imperative, a command. Let him not keep on deceiving himself, okay, is what the text says. Uh, if any man among you uh, seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So what does it mean to be wise? Well, uh, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The world system, the wisdom of the world, religious system based on human merit, as I first pointed out when I first started in the book of Ephesians four years ago or so, five years ago, uh, human merit, personal sacrifice, self, the flesh, law. It's all foolishness with God. That system that's based, it centers around that. It's all foolishness with God. I don't think the word wise here, you know, primarily means, you know, mathematician or medical doctor or nuclear physicist or, or whatever. I think we're talking about wisdom that has to do with spiritual truth. Let's keep it in context. Okay, the wisdom of the world religious system, which defiles, corrupts the temple of God, which God has set aside for his use. That is a system that is foolish with foolishness with God. And it surely is a system of religion. Okay. It absolutely is. Marvel not that the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. It'll put you out of the synagogue. It'll put you to death thinking it's doing God service or, or sacrifice. That's the world system. 
you know, all the false religions, uh, all the false teachings that abound, thing, you know, things are not getting better and better and better, okay, from a human perspective. Uh, not in the not in the church, not in the body of Christ. It is from God's perspective, but not from a human perspective. False teaching is spread throughout the world, throughout Christendom. Uh, what is spreading around the world is primarily false doctrine. We are not winning the battle, okay, from a human perspective. It doesn't appear that we are. Uh, in fact, we're told that in the last days, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Uh, Christianity is a victorious theological system. Uh, the world system is anti-God. It doesn't need God, doesn't love God, doesn't care about God, doesn't seek after God, doesn't want God. And God said that it would be that way. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. You know, I really admired most of my uh, my mentors, you know, in the past, uh, those who influenced me, those who discipled me. Uh, most were very sharp spiritually, but some of them, in my opinion, they they failed just like Israel did, to place their focus on Christ instead of men. Verse 21, therefore let no man glory that is boast in men. Tell me that doesn't fit the context of everything we've seen. Bama, pretty much the whole book so far. It's a golden thread that's woven all throughout. You and I both know that's pretty much where we are today, theologically speaking. Uh, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And I'm going to just touch on this. We'll pick up again on this the next video. All things are yours. I'm just going to let you know right now, okay? That's not, well, I do not believe that saying that the universe is mine, that what's beyond the universe is mine. Everything in heaven is mine. Uh, all the good things in, in, in glory are mine. Everything that, or even everything that Christ did for me, that's all mine. Folks, I'm going to suggest, just for your thinking, that you're, uh, and I, I have to be gentle about this. I know I do. I have to be very respectful and, and gentle about this. I think, given the context, given what we've seen and I think that all things are yours that's amazing four words that almost be are beyond description in my opinion I think what the Holy Spirit the heart of the Holy Spirit the thought that he's trying to convey in these four words goes beyond what we could ever imagine it is uh, we tend to think of that just well, only the good, that's just talking about good things. I don't think that's true at all. I think my, you know, my, my, my car wreck, my, uh, my, uh, I don't know, uh, my cancer, my, uh, uh, my broken relationship with my wife or my kids, my, um, uh, what's we see going on around us in the world today. All these things are ours. Okay. And so we're going to talk about that. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you so much for your prayers, for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. Let not your heart be troubled. Be not afraid. Our God is God. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.